the Joe Rogan experience. Um, you talked recently about the dangers of overly uh, politically correct thinking, of, of just politically correct thinking, of, of, of a sort of a rebound effect, where politically correct thinking is uh, actually causing more extremism and more, more radical thinking in, yeah. in terms of response to that. Like an overcorrection. Yeah. So we at the at the at the top of our conversation, we talked about the uh, the, the possibility of, of um, sex differences as being kind of taboo from polite company. And in a lot, of, I'll give another example, and this is kind of connects to our, our this conversation. Is in a lot of academia, there's just capitalism is just a dirty word, and uh, or something now called neoliberalism. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, uh, a uh, certain percentage, surprisingly large percentage of academics are actually Marxists. Probably about fifteen percent in the social sciences. Uh, and uh, to say the obvious fact that capitalism is better than communism. I mean, that's just a fact. I mean, just compare, you know, would you rather live in South Korea or North Korea? <laughs> would you rather live in the old East Germany or West Germany? Uh, would you rather live now in Venezuela or in Chile? And it's just obvious that capitalism makes people uh, richer and freer and better off in pretty much every way. Now, that's a fact that's almost unmentionable in uh, academia. Now, but if you say it by itself, and suddenly people discover it for the first time, then you can get the extreme right-wing position that any amount of regulation is bad, any amount of uh, social spending is bad. We need the most extreme form of almost anarcho-capitalism, like radical libertarianism. And that's because, uh, I, th I argue, that if you never have a discussion of the relative advantages and disadvantages of different economic systems, you never hear the arguments for why some mixture of a free market with regulation of things that have to be regulated because the market won't take care of them, like pollution. I mean, the market just won't put a, put a price on the atmosphere because no one owns the atmosphere. And so having a combination of a free market with environmental regulations gives you the best of both worlds. Likewise, social spending for the elderly, for children, for the sick, for the unlucky, uh, that's not incompatible with a free market. And in fact, some of the countries with the strongest social safety nets also are the ones with the most economic freedom. So that argument that I've just given you right now just doesn't take place because there's just such a commitment to the idea that capitalism is bad, opening up the possibility that someone discovers, hey, capitalism isn't so bad, then they leap to the strongest possible conclusion. Well, if as soon as you have social security, then we're going to be like Venezuela, Venezuela or, 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 or carbon pricing. And the rational way of organizing society with just the right balance of free markets, regulation, and social spending is just something that doesn't get discussed out in the open. You get these polarized extremes. Anyway, that, that's the argument that I made. What, what's the origin of that thought process in academia? Like, why has capitalism been demonized and socialism been, been praised, despite all the evidence that, especially Marxist socialism or Marxism, is just, it's never been shown to be effective and it's been shown to be very dangerous? Yeah, it, it's a good question. One theory from um, Thomas Sowell, an economist at the, the Hoover Institution, is that intellectuals tend to like systems that where you can articulate a theory in a bunch of verbal propositions and you know the government kind of implements them whereas uh, there are certain phenomena in, in in social life like market economies where the intelligence is distributed across millions of people no one actually knows how to make the system work but people make things look for buyers they set the price where people will, can, will, will buy them uh, and then over the entire society things kind of work out, but no one actually, no single individual has the theory as to how that ought to work. A, a language is another example. I mean, there's no committee that designed the English language. Uh, there's no theory of how the English language ought to work. It's like hundreds of millions of people just talking, and they invent new slang, and they slur, and they uh, emphasize, and they borrow from other languages, and the language changes, and it you know, works pretty well. Here we are speaking in English, and no committee mm. ever designed it. So according to Sowell's theory, and he, I think he was influenced by uh, Hayek, Friedrich Hayek, the Austrian uh, economist, that 
systems of distributed intelligence where no one genius ever designed it, but millions of people cooperating give rise to a collective intelligence, kind of run against the grain of the way intellectuals often think. Not all intellectuals, because of course you could do what Hayek and Sowell did and realized there is this phenomenon of collective intelligence, but if your first impulse is, what's the theory, uh, you know, what are the set of principles, then you're going to gravitate to planned, uh, you know, hyper-planned systems and be a little bit oblivious to distributed systems. Well, but in academia, for whatever reason, Looking at things in terms of uh, from a socialist standpoint, looking at things as a distribution of wealth is a big, a, a common uh, subject that keeps getting brought up, and um, class structures that there's going to be uh, a time if everything works out correctly, if we continue to evolve our culture, where we will no longer have classes, we'll no, and we'll be able to uh, distribute wealth completely equally across the board. But it's sort of denying the uh, the motivation that human beings have to succeed. It's designing the de um, denying this desire that people have to stand out and to overachieve or to to be, to be an outlier yeah. in terms of performance, which is just a, a natural part of human beings. And also competition. That competition is fueled by reward. And without competition, you don't have iPhones. You don't have most of the technological innovation that we have, uh, that, that's been funded by these companies. They've done it in order to make money. Yeah. It, there's there's got to be some sort of a reason why they pushed all these things. It's so ironic when someone is talking about how capitalism sucks on an iPhone. <laughs> right. I mean, the, Jesus yes. Christ! Like that—that that is one of the more bizarre ironies that is. is unexposed. Well, you know, I think you put your finger on another phenomenon, and I discuss this in my my book, The Blank Slate, where I also discuss the kind of the politics of, of gender. That part of it is there's there's a history to it. So there was an idea, uh, sometimes called social Darwinism. It wasn't. It had nothing to do with Darwin, ironically. But the idea that the only way societies progress is through ruthless cutthroat competition and poor people are just dragging the species down and you know, screw them and, and if, we, if we're, we're bleeding hearts then we'll retard the progress of society and we need you know, just uh, everyone against everyone else for, to, to advance. Now, you know, that, that's really not a very good way to organize a society, but there's such a, a reaction against that in the 20th century that you got the opposite extreme that we are all blank slates, that is we all start off uh, identical and that uh, any kind of competition is bad. You need kind of this, the benevolent government to distribute everything the, in the fairest possible manner. Now, the reality is, gonna, is something in between. We are, uh, there's going to be inequality in any fair system simply because some people really are smarter than others and some people have more discipline and more self-control. And, uh, and it's good to harness that so that the, our competitive impulses have some people burning the midnight oil and racking their brains to how to make things better off because they anticipate some rewards. You don't want to sap all uh, incentives, which is kind of what happened in, in the Soviet Union. You also don't want a central committee to decide that everyone has to have the, the same amount and, and parcel out every reward because that just gives too much power to a government. But it also doesn't mean that you have the opposite extreme where the, the you know, if the poor people die, then it's their own fault because they're lazy and stupid. I mean, that's just, right. it's not true. It's not humane. And what we need to do is find the right balance between c competition and freedom that makes everyone better off and recognition that just be, it, there are going to be people who are you know, not as smart, but they don't deserve to starve. Uh, there are people who are just going to be unlucky because a lot of wealth isn't distributed by uh, talent and, and hard work, but there's a lot of luck that goes into it as well. And so we may want to kind of uh, uh, sand down some of the sharp edges of competition there. And it, it doesn't have to be either or. And the thing is, if you make one position taboo, then that makes things either or. But how bizarre is it that these kind of rational conversations about this very important subject is taboo in intellectual 
circles and and it's, in it's not good academia. Well, it's, how did that happen? It's not good. I, you know, I think some of it is a, a reaction to the excesses of, of of the past. Some of it because people do tend to form tr uh, kind of intellectual tribes. Mm -hmm. Say you have sports teams, uh, and you root for your team. And you know, and when you're a sports fan, when you acquire information, it isn't to become better and better informed in some objective way. It's to kind of enhance the fan experience. You want to find out what's great about your team and what's you know awful about the other team. And that's a, a human habit that we bring to intellectual debates where, and, and academia, academics are, are, are as susceptible to it as any, anyone else, unless they take steps to recognize it and avoid it. But you know, if you're on the left, you root for the left team. And if you're on the right, not so much in the universities, but in the think tanks, you root for the right team. And you tend to discount evidence that goes against your ideology. You kind of filter out the things that are a little bit embarrassing. Uh, and uh, uh, people then, uh, adopt certain opinions as almost loyalty badges. And this is true of a lot of controversies that people often think are due to scientific uh, illiteracy, like climate change, uh, where you ask a lot of scientists, why do people deny the obvious facts of, of man-made climate change? And they think, well, the people just don't get enough information. We need better outreach. And I think we do need better outreach. But in fact, and I, I talk about this in Enlightenment, Enlightenment Now, if you actually do surveys of how well people understand climate science, there's not virtually no correlation between acknowledgement of human-made climate change and sophistication in climate science. So you get people who do believe in human-made climate change, which I, I think is an incontrovertible uh, fact at this point, but they don't really understand it. I mean, they may even think, oh, it's caused by a hole in the ozone layer, and we can fix it by cleaning up toxic waste dumps. I mean, like crazy beliefs, but they're still on, you know, what I would consider the right, the right side. Mm. What happens is that in some politicized debates, the, tr the people don't don't so much care about the truth; they care about what belief will earn them esteem in their their peer group. Right, right. Now, this is human psychology, but it's really bad when it comes to arriving at the best understanding of the truth collectively. And what we need, both in the left wing academic departments and the right wing think tanks, is kind of recognition. We're probably all wrong about a lot of things, especially if we talk to each other and 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 act like kind of litigators like lawyers who mount the best possible case for our side to prosecute it against the other side, that's just not a good way of arriving at the truth. You've got to kind of check the tendencies in yourself to just want more and more evidence for your belief and, and force yourself to be, and force other people to be as open-minded as possible. <laughs>